Let's have a look at the difference in cooling systems for combustion engines, electric cars and fuel cell vehicles today. In radiator development, there is one important formula, Q dot equals K times A times delta T. This effectively says that the heat flow is the K factor times the area of the radiator times the temperature difference. Delta T is the temperature difference between water inlet and outlet, and the area is the complete surface area of the radiator. The K factor is an adjustment factor in this formula and tells you how efficient the radiator net is. The higher the better. But to make this formula a bit more usable in daily engineering life, there are two simplifications. The area is not the complete surface area of a radiator, but only height times width, or in other words, the radiator net area. That's easy to measure in every workshop, and different depths will be compensated by a higher or lower k factor. The other simplification is delta t. Since car manufacturers test their cars in certain hot weather conditions, the ambient temperature is important to them. And so the delta T describes the difference between the radiator inlet and the ambient temperature. The K factor again compensates for the rest of the formula, so it will adjust for the simplifications. If there is a new radiator, it will be tested on a test bench first, the area and temperature difference are known, and the heat flow can be measured. So the K factor can be worked out and then be used in simulations. So if we now take a standard radiator and look at a combustion engine car, it can run at up to 120 degrees Celsius. Let's say the car is developed for an ambient temperature of up to 40 degrees, then the delta T is 80 Kelvin. The radiator has a certain K factor and net area, and this gives us a heat flow, Q dot, the cooling performance of this radiator. If we then take the same radiator and look at an electric car, its water cycle can, depending on the manufacturer, run it up to 80 degree. So for an ambient temperature of 40 degree, this gives us a delta T of only 40 Kelvin. In other words, because of the lower operating temperature of electric drivetrains, the cooling performance under the same circumstances with the same radiator will be only half as much compared to a combustion drivetrain. Because of the high efficiency of electric drivetrains, that's still fine and electric cars can still work with smaller radiators than combustion engine cars. But this becomes a problem if we are looking at fuel cell drivetrains. A fuel cell car has an electric drivetrain like an electric car, but additionally it has a fuel cell with only around 50% of efficiency on board to power the drivetrain. From a thermodynamics point of view, that means that there is much more waste heat and hence a much higher cooling requirement. But at the same time, are the operating temperatures on the same low level as electric cars? The result is that fuel cell cars need the largest cooling packages available. Let's have a look at an example to understand a bit better what's happening here. We take a standard car that is driving at 125 km per hour or 78 miles per hour constantly. We assume an air density of 1.2 kg per cubic meter, a drag coefficient of 0.3 and a frontal area of 2 square meter. We can work out that the required power to overcome the drag is 15 kW. We then assume that the weight of the car is 1500 kg and the tires have a resistance factor of 0.01. The power required to overcome the rolling resistance is 5 kW. So we need a total of 20 kW to drive this car at 125 km per hour constantly. Let's take the ICE car first. A general rule of thumb is that one third of the input power from the fuel will be converted into power to move the vehicle forward. One third will be heat going into the cooling system and one third will leave the engine through the exhaust. In reality, we know that the efficiency of combustion engines is usually lower than 33% and the cooling system does not get the 33% either. But to keep this example simple, we will go with this simplification. So if I want 20 kW from a combustion engine to drive my car forward, I need to input 60 kW through fuel. 
20 kilowatt will be power from the engine, 20 kilowatt will have to be cooled by the cooling system and 20 kilowatt will leave the car through the exhaust. Now let's have a look at the electric car. We assume a not too good efficiency of 93% for the energy extraction of the battery, for the inverter and for the electric motor. Together that means that the overall efficiency is 80% from the battery to the motor shaft. If we need 20 kilowatt to drive the car, we will have to input 25 kilowatt from the battery. 20 kilowatt are used for driving and 5 kilowatt will have to be cooled by the cooling system. So compared to the ICE drivetrain, the electric car only needs 25% of cooling. But now we have to remember what we learned in the first part about the temperature levels. Because the electric car is running at much lower temperatures, Cooling performance is only half, which means that we need to double the radiator size to compensate for that, assuming that K stays the same. So in summary, that means that the electric car only needs half the cooling of an ICE car for doing the same thing. Now let's have a look at the fuel cell car. Like we said before, they have the same drivetrain like an electric car, but additionally have a fuel cell on board. Let's assume the fuel cell has a very good efficiency of 60% and we assume 93% for charging the battery and keep the same efficiencies for the following components like the electric car. That results in an overall efficiency of 45% from the fuel cell to the motor shaft. There is a boost function for fuel cell cars where the battery is bypassed and the fuel cell is driving the electric motor directly. The efficiency for that would be 52%. If we now need 20 kW again to drive our car, we need to input 45 kW into the system. 25 kW will have to be cooled by the cooling system. We don't have the convenience here that one third of the heat will leave the car through the exhaust. All components are water cooled and the heat stays within the car and needs to be cooled by the cooling system. So that means that we need even more cooling than for an ICE car. And now again, we need to remember the same low temperature levels of the fuel cell drivetrain. Again, we need to double the radiator size to compensate for the lower temperature difference compared to the ICE car. The result is that the fuel cell car needs 2.5 times more cooling than an ICE car, doing the same thing where the electric car only needs half the cooling. Even if we assume that the boost function for this constant speed is used, we would still need nearly twice as much cooling compared to the ICE car. So how do manufacturers solve this problem? One, they use the largest radiators they have for fuel cell vehicles plus additional side radiators. Of course that means they also need large air intakes and that increases drag. And two, they limit their power to around 150 kilowatt. So I hope you enjoyed this little explanation about the cooling systems and let me know which one is your favorite drivetrains in the comments below.